I'm very well, sir. We're so grateful and uh, so nice to finally see you. Uh, lecture took took its time in organizing, but I'm so grateful that you're here. And uh, I think I think there's no I, better. I, I would be I would be even more grateful if I were where you are. Well, <laughs> but, but I must share this also with you because this is the Bible for anyone who studies international law. And uh, uh, just one moment. Okay, do you have the updated version as well? There this you is go. the ninth edition. <laughs> okay, well, this is uh, this is the eighth. I have the eighth, so perhaps I'll have that's to order. From, that's from 2017. Okay, and well, we'll start in a little while. The class usually starts at around seven, uh, sorry, 5.15. So we do have a bit of time on our hands and okay. uh, uh, we're, we're just grateful that you're here with us and uh, we can't wait to start. Okay, I'm very grateful for your um, for your invitation. And I must also share with you as well, I, I'm not sure if you will know this, but tomorrow is a uh, World Photography Day. And uh, oh. uh, during, during my well, years at uh, undergraduate, I was a big photography buff. So oh. what, what we've done is, a couple of students in the society, we've created a photo <coughs> album of India's contributions to the United Nations. So starting okay. from <coughs> excellent, from Madam, starting from Madam Gandhi to Mr. Jay Shankar, we've or Dr. Jay Shankar, we've covered everyone, and I'll share a link of this with you, and we hope to share this with with everyone as well tomorrow. Okay. You'll get the sneak peek before the show. <laughs> I'm honoured. Thank you. <clears throat> so, do you, do you do you teach there? Well, no, I'm still studying. I usually get told. I usually get asked whether I'm teaching. Sometimes I'm also addressed as a doctor. So I'm still. Uh, I'm in my law. I'm in the law school. I'm in the final year of my law school's ah. uh, studies. I have a bachelor's degree in international relations. So that's for my. Uh, uh, interested so in on your way. Well, yes. In fact, <coughs> in fact, this this interest in international law started when I visited Oxford but during my undergrad, and professors Dapo Kande and Antonio Zanokopoulos taught me over there. So ever since, this this bug has bit me, and uh, your writings have been most helpful in the continuation of my studies of international uh, law. So that's, that's very, very kind of you to say. No, sir, this is least that one can say it. Your writings are perhaps the zenith of of this subject. So we're so grateful well, that you're here. Well, <clears throat> no, no, I'm 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 very grateful to have been asked. Um, <clears throat> it's a very strange feeling because I've done a number of these lectures now by Zoom to a variety of countries around the world and I I'm a I'm an armchair traveler now. I think it's best you know I was in fact watching a discussion and this was uh, this was Farid Zakaria and he said exactly what you're saying I mean persons of your ilk save so much precious time and also money because you spend half your time in aeroplanes and your aeroplane is the reading, your reading room is the aeroplane. So now you can do everything, with all of this from your, your you know, comforts of your uh, personal spaces. And I think it's it's wonderful. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's very good. It, it also enables universities around the world to be able to invite people like myself or all the others, very impressive people you've had giving your lectures um, without costing you anything. Yes. You, know, well, you, could been, I mean, you couldn't have been able to afford to uh, pay for the travel expenses of everybody that you have. <clears throat> so this way um, you build up a good personal connection without having to pay travel expenses or accommodation. I, on the other hand, lose out but I, because <laughs> I don't get to visit. <laughs> <laughs> but, but sir, I must share with you, Professor Bobowski is also here. You can yes, hi, Markham. Thank you Hello. for your Hello, it's nice to meet you. As, as you say, it would have been too expensive to bring you in a normal circumstance, so we are very grateful to Corona. 
for being able to start and uh, very progressively uh, advance the general society of international law, mostly because of the students. They are the drivers of this society. Well, this, this, this is the human condition exactly. to be flexible, <laughs> to, to be flexible, to manage and to survive. Absolutely. Very so I clear. must share a very interesting anecdote here. There were two British uh, businessmen who went down south in Africa. One of them reported back to Manchester saying that, great, nobody wears shoes, business opportunity booming. And the other one said, and the other one said, poor business condition, no one wears shoes. So I think it's all in the, <laughs> I think it's all in the mindset. Exactly. Yeah. Is the glass half full or half empty? Yeah. Exactly. Hello, hello, Professor Malcolm. Uh, I'm Abhinav Merotra. I'm professor. I'm co-instructor with Professor Poposki for this course. It's an honor to be uh, to have you today. And, it's nice, to, nice to meet you. It's your your as Ankit correctly pointed out. Your textbook is is a bible for international law students, irrespective of where whether they are beginning or they in their mid career or they're starting off. So it's it's great to be meeting you visually. So indeed, that's very kind of you. To say. <laughs> when I studied my LLM and PhD in London School of Economics and King's College London, it was already there. So I'm very privileged to meet Malcolm after so many years, Re reading the books from back in the 1990s. My, well, my big <laughs> pleasure and honor. <clears throat> Thank you Malcolm. very much. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's now over 40 years since I wrote the first edition. But I was then a very, I suppose, a rather arrogant young man um, who thought I, at that age I could do an introduction to international law. But uh, anyway, it, it, it developed since then. And since uh, Cambridge University Press took it over in the 1980s, it, it developed into a proper academic <coughs> textbook um, the, way, the way that I wanted it to be. And... Um, and, and so it continues and the ninth edition has just come out. But I have to tell you that the last four editions now, um, the the covers have been painted by my son. Oh, OK. So I'm very, I'm very proud of that. He's very well, talented. Con congratulations. Oh, thank you. But this is this is the um, not the cheaper version which circulates in some countries. I don't know what the cover of that is, but the cover of that uh, that that is produced by Cambridge, because I think you showed showed me. Yes, and but now I want to show a different book because what you shared is something which my father also did. I told you I do photography, so my father also writes quite a lot, and he 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 borrowed a photograph of mine, and. Uh, this uh, is a photograph I took. I, I'll share this copy with you. I'll, in fact, have it posted and delivered to your desk. He writes on international. <laughs> so since, since this is a common feature which we oh, have, of, of <coughs> sharing, I'll uh, most certainly share this with you as well, because uh, this is something that will perhaps resonate more strongly with you <laughs> because uh, of yes. the well, practice. It's, well, it, it's, it's nice when these things are family affairs. Yes, most certainly. Yeah. So, um, how when are we starting? In a couple of minutes. Oh uh, yes. Um, All yes, right. Could you give me minutes. two minutes to get a glass of water ready? I'll be back sure. in two minutes. Yes. Sure. Yes. Uh, Anki, the, the topic is about the United Nations and is it relevant today, right? Yeah. So that's right. Uh, okay. Dr. Shaw has titled it as, uh, is, the, is there a future for the United Nations and is if so, what? Okay, yeah. Okay, I will, I will say a few words in the beginning. Is, the is there I'd, a future of for the United Nations. So I'd send, a, I'd, send, I'd send his bio to you on email right. as well. 
uh, I got that. Yes, I can say I can introduce him. Uh, and I, in fact, I will also introduce the course and the students. I will tell him very briefly what our course is about so that somehow the speech he prepared is uh, channel into the course of United Nations. Well, it, it is United Nations law and practices. What I, I will ask him to talk primarily not so much on the ICJ and his cases there, other than on the Security Council and, and the, the system, the UN system generally. Mm. Okay. Okay, I think I'm. Um... I'm Thank you. We, we have uh, students already joining. Uh, so let's go. So it's 5 15 in their time. And again, my, my big honor, a privilege, and pleasure to introduce Malcolm Shaw today, uh, the, one of the most distinguished uh, international lawyers uh, over the last 40 years. And as we just discussed, his uh, Textbook on international law has already nine editions. In fact, I, I was privileged already to study for my first degree uh, during the early 90s on, on the same book. And Malcolm has been a practicing barrister professor and developed international reputation for advising on many issues, territorial disputes, law of the sea, state succession, state immunity, recognition of foreign governments, human rights, self-determination, international arbitration. He's been advisor to the UK government legal department, the Army Prosecuting Authority, the CPS, and very uh, number of foreign governments as well. He has appeared before the International Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Justice, the Court of Final Appeal Hong Kong, the High Court of Ireland, and many, many others. I think students have received already all the details. Uh, the lecture today, we would like to focus a little bit more on the United Nations. We had already a uh, talk on the International Court of Justice, so we formulated the topic as uh, does the United Nations have a future? <laughs> a little bit... Uh, catastrophic uh, question, I must say, and it reminds me what uh, once Kofi Annan back in 2005 wrote uh, that uh, the United Nations is uh, facing a fork in a road, uh, reform or die. So he put it similarly bluntly. In other words, if the United Nations doesn't face the challenge of modernizing, revitalization, and uh, reform, it might become irrelevant soon. And, uh, well, he already proposed a large uh, portfolio of reforms back at the time, 2005, his report in Larger Freedom. However, we haven't seen, unfortunately, much. Uh, we have seen some progress, but not probably sufficient progress in, since then. And the United Nations continues to play a role. Uh, we, we, we see several successful attempts by the current Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, also to uh, inject uh, some uh, fresh uh, ideas into, into the organization. And, and I will finish with my introduction here. Also, probably we shouldn't be over enthusiastic and somehow create over expectations. Uh, I remember in one conference, uh, I faced the question, uh, what does the United Nations bring to the table? And my answer was, well, the table. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the United Nations is a table around which uh, states, governments, uh, interna other international organizations, well, all the actors in international law and international relations, can utilize as a convening power, as a forum, as a, as a UN charter with principles and purposes. Uh, 
to uh, do what they think is the best for the international community, for, for themselves and so on. Uh, so today, uh, again, we have a huge privilege and honor to have Malcolm Shaw with us on the topic, does the United Nations have a future? The format is usual. The, uh, Malcolm, this is a joint lecture between the Jindal Society and, of course, law and practice of the United Nations. Uh, and uh, therefore, the, the, that's why the focus is more on the United Nations rather than on the International Court of Justice. Uh, and the format is uh, you, you speak first and after that students ask questions. Ankit can moderate that afterward. Thank you very much again, please. Uh, our great uh, thanks. And we hope next time we can host you in person in our beautiful campus in Haryana in India. Uh, Professor Shaw, before we just start, could we, uh, is it fine if we upload this lecture on YouTube? on the society's channel? Uh, yes, if you if you want to, if you really think it's worth it. I, are you comfortable with it? That's uh, our yeah. Con yeah, it's OK. Thank I mean, you. I can see that you're recording it. So. Thank you. Uh, OK. Well, first of all, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. <coughs> I uh, would, of course, much have preferred coming to see you in person, but um, I will have to do this from my my own little room and you can see all my uh, books behind me. This is to prove that I actually do have some books and do do some work from time to time. Well, does the UN have a future and if so, what may it be? I'm going to make a few general comments. The evolution of the modern nation state and the consequent development of an international order founded upon a growing number of independent and sovereign territorial units inevitably gave rise to questions of international cooperation. The UN marks the meeting place of these two approaches linked as they are in a nervous relationship. The first major instance of organized international cooperation occurred with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, which ended the 30 year religious wars of Central Europe and formally established the modern secular nation state arrangement of European politics. Over a century later, the Napoleonic Wars concluded with the Congress of Vienna in 1815, marking the first systematic attempt to regulate international affairs by means of regular international conferences. This Congress system lasted in various guises for practically a century and institutionalized not only the balance of power approach to politics, but also a semi-formal international order. The 19th century also witnessed a considerable growth in international non-governmental associations, such as the International Committee of the Red Cross, and the International Law Association. These private international unions, unions demonstrated a wide ranging community of interest on specific topics and an awareness that cooperation had to be international to be effective. The work done by these organizations was and remains of considerable value in influencing governmental activities and stimulating world action. They mark perhaps the commencement of the functionally oriented process. In addition, they developed a series of public international unions. These were functional associations linking together government departments for specific purposes and set up by treaties. The first instances of such intergovernmental associations were provided by the international commissions established for the more efficient functioning of such vital arteries of communication as the Rhine and the Danube rivers, and later for other rivers of Europe. The powers given to the particular commissions varied from case to case, but most of them performed important administrative and legislative functions. In 1865, the International Telegraphic Union was set up with a permanent bureau 
and nine years later, the Universal Postal Union was created, combining a permanent bureau with periodic conferences, with decisions being taken by majority vote. A step forward, since one of the weaknesses of the political order of ad hoc conferences had been the necessity for unanimity. The most important legacy of the 1919 peace treaties from the point of view of international relations was perhaps the creation of the League of Nations. The League, the League consisted of an assembly and an executive council, but was crippled from the start by the absence of the United States and the Soviet Union for most of its life, and it remained a basically European organization. While it did have certain minor successes with regard to the maintenance of international order, it failed when confronted with determined aggressors. Japan invaded China in 1931 and later withdrew from the League. Italy attacked Ethiopia. Germany embarked unhindered upon a series of internal and external aggressions. The Soviet Union, in a final gesture, was expelled from the League in 1939 following its invasion of Finland. Nevertheless, some useful groundwork was achieved by the League in its short existence. The UN was established following the conclusion of the Second World War and in the light of Allied planning and intentions expressed during that conflict. The purposes of the UN, UN are set out in Article 1 of the Charter as follows. 1. To maintain international peace and security, and to that end, to take effective collective measures and to bring about by peaceful mean, means and in conformity with the principles of justice and international law, the settlement of international disputes. 2. To develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principles of equal rights and self-determination of peoples. 3. To achieve international cooperation in solving uh, international problems of an economic, social, cultural or humanitarian character and in promoting and encouraging respect for human rights for all. And four, to be a centre for harmonising the actions of nations in the attainment of these common ends. While these purposes are certainly far ranging, they are prioritised and legal obligations primarily focused upon the first purpose and the establishment of machinery to achieve this. While the emphasis upon decolonization, self-determination and apartheid mirrored the growth in UN membership and the dismantling of the colonial empires, the Charter originally saw these issues in terms of political aspirations rather than binding legal commitments. We may thus identify some of the leading contemporary themes in international law. First, the changing focus from states exclusively to states plus various non-state bodies ranging from individuals to groups and from bodies claiming statehood to various forms of multi-state organisational activity and through to multinational corporations. Secondly, the move from a more comprehensive resolution of differences approach to a more restrained and focused functionalism in international endeavours. Thirdly, the challenge of modern technology for both good and evil. Fourthly, the concern with globalisation, its advantages and its shortcomings. The UN is an organisation composed of nation states. Membership is restricted to states. Voting is by states. The purpose and principles of the UN are predicated upon the acceptance of the sovereignty and independence of states, buttressed by core rules as to non-intervention, domestic jurisdiction and the protection of the territorial integrity and political independence of states. However, the UN has over the decades become more receptive to the role that may be played in the international system, 
by the variety of non-state actors that have arisen. First and foremost, individuals and groups. The UN Charter refers in Article 55 to respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples and to human rights. But this was in the context of peaceful and friendly relations among nations and was aspirational in nature. In 1960, the General Assembly adopted the Colonial Declaration, declaring that all peoples have the right to self-determination and that by virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. The International Court of Justice in the Chagos Advisory Opinion in 2019 held that this declaration had a normative character with regard to the right. Other general and specific declarations and resolutions followed rapidly. <clears throat> and together with the International Court's approach in cases such as Namibia, Western Sahara, East Timor, construction of a wall, Kosovo, Kosovo and Chagos, it's become clear that self-determination is indeed a legal right of peoples. What this means, however, is another matter, but that, however, is for another occasion. Together with the establishment of this right, the UN also focused upon the human rights of individuals. The work of the Expert Human Rights Committee under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and other expert committees under an increasing number of specialist treaties dealing with questions ranging from women to children to migrants to disabled people and so on uh, reinforces this. The UN Human Rights Council, which is composed of state representatives, has had a more checkered experience. While dealing with conceptual issues such as the disappeared or arbitrary executions or religious discrimination, it has produced valuable source material, albeit sometimes of variable quality. However, in certain matters, the Council has opened itself up to charges of undue politicisation and accusations of bias, and its credibility has indeed been challenged. Regional conventions on human rights, however, have played pivotal roles in the protection of human rights well away from the UN. Examples of the European Convention on Human Rights, the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights, and the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. And one must also mention here the importance of the specialised agencies in such matters. The move away from the exclusive focus upon states has also been manifested with regard to other bodies. There are entities that claim statehood, but which have as yet failed to obtain an international consensus with regard to their claims for various reasons. Controversial examples abound, such as Taiwan, Palestine, Somaliland, Northern Cyprus, Transnistria, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. I don't propose to discuss these individually, but solely to make the point that international law from time to time has sometimes, sometimes to make some form of accommodation with them. The General Assembly, for example, granted observer status to the PLO and then in Resolution 67 19 accepted Palestine as a non-member observer state. What this means in fact or in law is unclear either for the UN or for its members or for other bodies or other states. However, it has enabled Palestine to obtain membership of specialist bodies that have a more flexible approach to statehood insofar as their own work and context is concerned. Indeed, the International Court itself, the parties to which can only be states, has on occasion felt the need to draw in non-state bodies. In the construction of a wall case in 2004, the court was able to hear the representatives of Palestine, then very clearly not a state, while in the Kosovo state in 2010, 
the court was able to hear the representatives of the authors of the Unilateral Declaration of Independence. Of course, both cases were requests for advisory opinions and not contentious matters as such. I turn now to the question of the move from a comprehensive resolution model to a more focused functionalism in international law. By this, I mean the evolution of the mechanisms of international society from the all embracing focus upon restraining the use of force by states and the peaceful settlement of disputes between states to concern with more specialized and conceptual issues such as health, economic development, trade, technology, and so forth. But first a word about the traditional role of the UN as envisaged um, initially in the Charter. The Security Council, and I will focus on this, was intended to operate as an efficient executive organ of limited membership functioning continuously. It was given primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. The Security Council consists of 15 members, five of them permanent, the USA, UK, Russia, China and France. And these permanent members, chosen on the basis of power politics in 1945, have the veto. The other 10 members are elected for two year terms by the General Assembly. A negative vote by any of the permanent members is therefore sufficient to veto any resolution of the Council, save with, regard, save with regard to certain procedural questions. The veto was written into the Charter in view of the exigencies of power. The USSR in particular would not have been willing at the time to accept the UN as it was envisaged without, without the establishment of the veto to protect it from the dominant Western presence in the Council and the General Assembly at that time. In practice, the, the veto was exercised by the Soviet Union on a considerable number of occasions and by the US less frequently and by other members pretty rarely. In more recent years, the exercise of the veto by the US has indeed increased. It does not, of course, follow that the five supreme powers of 1945 will continue to be the only permanent members of the Council, nor the only ones with a veto. However, the complicated mechanisms for amendment of the Charter, coupled with the existence of the veto, make any change difficult. The question of the expansion of Council membership has been before the UN for an appreciable period and various proposals have been made. One proposal, for example, would provide for six new permanent seats with no veto and three new non-permanent seats. Another would provide for no new permanent seats, but a new category of eight four-year renewable term seats and one new two-year non-permanent non-renewable seat. States usually seen as candidates for permanent positions on the Council include Germany, India, Japan and Brazil, but others are also keen to be considered and no consensus is yet in sight. The Council thus is concreted into the 1945 geopolitical situation. It no longer constitutes an accurate reflection of state power. The US, China and Russia remain great powers, but the UK and France own, are no longer in this category. And other countries are rising in importance and need to be accommodated within a contemporary perception of power and influence. The UN, to be able to mirror current realities, must consider change of a fundamental structural nature. The Security Council acts on behalf of the members of the organisation as a whole in performing its functions and its decisions, but not its recommendations, are indeed binding upon all member states. Its powers are concentrated in two particular categories, the peaceful settlement of disputes and the adoption of enforcement measures. 
By these means, the Council was intended to conduct its primary task, the maintenance of international peace and security. The Council also has some other function, functions acting together with the General Assembly, such as the admission of member states, amending the UN Charter and the election of judges of the International Court. Until the end of the Cold War, the Council generally did not fulfil the expectations held of it, although Resolution 242 of 1967 did lay down the basis for negotiations for a Middle East peace settlement and is still seen as an authoritative expression of some of the key principles to be taken into account. With the development of the Glasnost and Perestroika policies in the Soviet Union in the late 1980s, increasing cooperation with the US ensued and reached its highest point as the Kuwait crisis evolved. After the terrorist attacks on the United States of the 11th of September 2001, further activities ensued, including the adoption of resolutions condemning international terrorism, reaffirming the right of self-defense against this and establishing a counter-terrorism committee. However, the failure of the Council to agree upon measures concerning Iraq's possession of weapons of mass destruction, contrary to earlier resolutions, precipitated in 2002 and 3 a major division within the Council. The US and the UK uh, decided to commence military operations against Iraq in late March 2003 without express Security Council authorization and against the opposition of other permanent members. Despite this crisis, the Council began to assume a more proactive role in certain areas. The effect of Resolutions 1373 and 1540 with the establishment of monitoring committees of significant authority, together with the increasing use of sanctions against specific states and indeed specific individuals and bodies, has led to some to talk of a form of legislative activi activity. Nevertheless, recent years have seen a return to the rivalry of the leading powers. The US, China and Russia are conducting increasingly hostile moves with regard to each other, while rising concern with global issues and non-state entities constitutes a further level of complication. This sketches out the original intentions with regard to the UN, essentially focused upon the maintenance of international peace and security, while asserting a wide range of general principles ranging from self-determination and human rights to international development. The Security Council was to constitute the executive arm acting by binding decisions to sustain international peace. As is known, many of the, many of the general principles became concretized over time. The vague words as to self-determination and human rights in the Charter were firmed up and rendered legally obligatory by a combination of UN resolutions, declarations, international agreements and general state practice. Has the UN been a success in these terms? To some extent, but only to some extent. Major international conflicts were often not resolved by the Security Council and, and in many cases the Council was simply bypassed. The Middle East conflict was not resolved or even mitigated by the UN. The Indo-Pakistani hostilities have not eased. The Vietnam War was barely addressed. The Russian invasion of Afghanistan proceeded, as did the US-UK intervention in Iraq in 2003. The Iran-Iraq War carried on for some eight years with casualties in the millions. The long, long Afghan war appears perhaps to be over at last. The rising tension in the East and South China Seas continues to mount. In these and other, situation, in other situations, the UN role has been at best peripheral. So in this key primary function of the UN, does it have a future? The answer could be no more than 
maybe it depends it depends upon the configuration of the leading world powers particularly the us china russia the eu japan and india and how they wish to pursue their interests the un the un is a rules based international system which requires states to accept that there are some constraints on how they seek to attain their goals current indications are not particularly encouraging indeed it is ironic to note that the only signs of hope in the middle east with the signing of agreements between israel and a number of arab states has had absolutely nothing to do with the un but this is not the whole story the un has a role even if a truncated one it has produced and developed the concept of peacekeeping forces which do have an important function in mitigating the pressures to return to hostilities and may bridge that gap between fighting and resolution even if only in part flexibility and regional cooperation do point a way forward but it is hesitant controversial and success is far from assured the un is on stronger grounds with regard to carefully circumscribed activities of a more functional and less overtly political nature the specialized agencies on the whole have been a success and although politicization has raised its disruptive head from time to time in the main the work of these organizations proceeds a pace let me take some particular examples firstly outer space the initial structure of outer space law was laid down in a number of general assembly resolutions following the advent of the satellite era in the late 1950s the general assembly resolution 1962 of 1963 the declaration of legal principles governing the activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space laid down a series of applicable legal principles including the provisions that outer space and celestial bodies were free for exploration and use by all states on a basis of equality and in accordance with international law and that outer space and celestial bodies were not subject to national appropriation by any means this did not suffice and in 1967 the outer space treaty was adopted this reiterates that outer space including the moon and other celestial bodies it's not subject to national appropriation by any means and emphasizes that the exploration and use of outer space must be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries article 4 of this treaty provides that states parties to the treaty agree not to place in orbit around the earth any objects carrying nuclear weapons or any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction install such weapons on celestial bodies or station such weapons in outer space in any other manner there are disagreements as to the meaning of this provision um the article bans only nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction um although article 1 emphasizes that the use of space shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries some have argued that this can be interpreted to mean that any military activity in space contravenes the treaty but i think the practice now has moved beyond that the moon treaty of 1979 provides for the demilitarization of the moon and other celestial bodies and establishes the principle that the exploration and use of the moon shall be the province of all mankind and for the benefit of all the moon and its natural resources are deemed to be the common heritage of mankind and not subject to national appropriation by any means no private rights of ownership over the moon or any part of it or its natural resources may be created although all states parties have the right 
to uh, exploration and use of the moon. It was also agreed to, an esta to establish an international regime to govern the exploitation of the resources of the moon when this becomes feasible. However, the Moon Treaty currently has only 18 parties, and these do not include the US, the UK, Russia, China, India, Japan or France. Accord accordingly, its value is much diminished. It's difficult to see that this treaty can be taken as reflecting <coughs> customary international law in view of the attitude adopted by the leading space powers. This has led to uncertainties in the relevant law at a time that the technology to explore and exploit has accelerated. Further, concern has also revolved around the increasing number of satellites around the Earth with functions including navigational and observational missions and the evolution of small satellites in low orbit, while the development of anti-satellite weapons by the major powers is a major source of destabilization. Many countries have now tested, it is believed, anti-satellite missiles, while in July 2020, Russia has, uh, is believed to have tested an anti-satellite missile from a satellite already in space. Specific legal regulation is lagging, although attacking the satellite of another state may well constitute an armed attack and uh, contrary to the UN Charter. An issue of a special concern relates to plans for the increasing commercialization of activities, including the mining of natural resources on the moon and in outer space, which do not appear to be consistent with the Moon Treaty or indeed with the concept of the global commons. There are several domestic pieces of legislation ranging from the US Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act of 2015, the Luxembourg Law of July 2017 and the UAE Federal Law of 2019. At the least, there is confusion as to the legal position as the continuing debates in the legal subcommittee of the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space clearly demonstrate. Further, there is the question of the legal regulation of non-state private activities, such as space tourism and the use of private corporations in the process of accessing and exploiting outer space. NASA has opened the International Space Station to commercial opportunities and private astronauts, while private corporations are now conducting an increasing number of launches into space, including recent high profile visits for touristic purposes by leading entrepreneurs. The range of private or public private space activities is rapidly expanding. Such activities require consideration of the integration of international and national space law, as well as clarification and development of the former. There is much to be done here, and while the UN is engaged, such engagement really does, does need to move up a gear. Secondly, cyber activities. The extraordinarily speedy development of the internet and consequential activities in what is becoming known as the cyber sphere is beginning to pose particular challenges as well as opportunities within the context of international law. Cyber techniques have evolved and continue to progress with unprecedented rapidity and in a global context with participants and victims ranging from states to international organizations, individuals, corporations and other non-state actors. The issue of information security has been on the UN agenda since 1998 and a group of governmental experts was created in 2002. This, uh, this has had limited success, limited success, although it has been agreed 
that international law applies. In 2018, the UN established two processes to consider relevant issues, an open-ended working group and a group of governmental experts on advancing responsible state behaviour in cyberspace in the context of international security. The essential factor about cyber activities is that they invariably cross frontiers and are difficult to identify. The core principle remains that of state sovereignty, that is, states retain their sovereignty over any cyber infrastructure located on their territory and associated activities <clears throat> while being able to exercise control and jurisdiction over the same. Similarly, a state remains internationally responsible for any unlawful act involved, provided attribution can be demonstrated. The paradox is that while cyber activities may range over multiple countries, they commence from one state that has the competence to exercise jurisdiction, and thus in principle, the legal problems faced with regard to the high seas or outer space, for example, do not apply. Applying the traditional rules of international law, law therefore, a state which conducts cyber activities violating the sovereignty of another state would be responsible for any un internationally wrongful act. A state is under an obligation <coughs> not to allow its territory or the cyber infrastructure it controls to be used for operations that affect the rights of other states and must thus exercise due diligence in this respect. The basic rules as to international responsibility remain the same. However, there remain many difficult problems, including as to proof. By very nature, cyber activities range widely and occur instantaneously, and it may be extremely difficult to prove whence they came. In many cases, the state in question wishes to conceal its activities, and in the absence of admission, it may be very difficult to proceed in terms of responsibility. There are indeed now an increasing number of examples of damage caused to states by cyber activities in circumstances where no other state accepts responsibility. Examples would include the attack by the Stuxnet virus on Iranian nuclear facilities, cyber attacks on Estonia, Georgia and Ukraine, the claimed Iranian attack on the water system of Israel in 2020, and the response against port facilities in Iran. In all of these cases, no express admission of responsibility was made, <clears throat> and thus attribution was difficult to prove. A relatively recent development has been the establishment by a number of states <coughs> of cyber offensive as well as defensive capabilities and agencies. Three areas in particular have been the focus of very recent concern. The conduct of hostilities, activities disruptive of domestic elections and constitutional processes, and actions that have arisen as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic that began at the end of 2019. Sadly, we have no time to examine these, but it has become a clear priority to establish a clear legal framework and rules and enforcement methods. <clears throat> Body, bodies outside of the UN have become very active in this field. The International Committee of the Red Cross has proposed a rule requiring states not to conduct cyber activity that would harm medical services or facilities. And there have been important private initiative, initiatives such as the unofficial but authoritative Tallinn Manual and the Oxford Statement on the, interna on the international law protections against cyber operations targeting the healthcare sector of May 2020. Many important legal issues <clears throat> remain to be resolved. 
the extent of damage necessary to generate responsibility, the extent of responsibility where damage is caused by the activities of a non-state actor on the territory of the state, and the question whether responsibility is absolute or fault-based. Again, to what extent is responsibility dependent on the precise form or degree of harm caused? And how flexible can the concept of attribution be in these circumstances? In this area, one perhaps has the impression that the UN is lagging behind in the process of developing the law. It was not until June this year, for example, that the Security Council debated the question of maintaining international peace and security in cyberspace. Finally, a few words about the COVID crisis engulfing the world and from which no individual, no group and no state has been immune. Issues concerning state sovereignty, international cooperation, individual privacy and economic considerations have abounded in the view of the in view of the extraordinary measures that have been needed to be taken to deal with the disease ranging from various forms of quarantine or lockdown to regulating social distancing and the wearing of masks and to the various surveillance measures taken to control movement and thus the spread of the disease large scale shutdown of industries and shops taken together with the closing of schools and places of worship have underlined the unprecedented interference with rights in this in these circumstances faced with this global crisis the various human rights bodies have issued guidance led by the un human rights committee which declared in april 2020 that states parties confronting the threat of widespread contagion may on a temporary basis resort to exceptional emergency powers and invoke their right of derogation from the international covenant subject to certain conditions such as strict necessity and proportional proportionality of any derogating measures taken the conformity of measures taken with other international obligations the prohibition on derogating from certain non-derogable rights and the other human rights bodies have issued similar statements more generally the crisis has focused attention on the right to health and international law and the role of the world health organization the recognition of a right to health may be traced to the preamble of the constitution of the who and Article 25 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Article 12 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has recognised the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. This has been reviewed by the committee established under that covenant. And it, it has noted that it includes entitlements to a system of health protection, providing equality of opportunity for people to enjoy the highest attainable level of health, taking into account the individual's biological and socioeconomic preconditions and the state's available resources. The right to health is an inclusive one and extends to matters such as access to safe and potable water, adequate sanitation, environmental conditions, and so on and so forth. A special rapporteur uh, on the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health was appointed in 2002, and um, that mandate has been extended and expanded subsequently. The Assembly of the WHO adopted binding international health regulations in 2005, subsequently amended in 2014. The purpose being to prevent, protect against, control and provide a public health response to the international spread of disease. States parties are obliged to notify the WHO 
of events that may constitute a public health emergency of international concern and procedures have been established for the determination by the director general of the WHO of such emergency and the issue of temporary recommendations. Many criticisms, criticisms however, have been made of the WHO's response to the COVID-19 crisis, including that of excessive politicization, particularly at the beginning of the crisis. The need for international cooperation to deal with the crisis has been glaringly apparent, has been the focus by each state upon its own needs, particularly with regard to the acquisition, distribution and use of the vaccines that have become available. The phenomenon now known as vaccine nationalism has appeared, has, as has the increasing gap between those states able to afford to purchase the large number of vaccines required and those that are not. The UN, through its various human rights organs, has pointed out the relevant principles, while the WHO has to some extent been successful, but the gaps have become apparent and the needs stark. Some concluding words now. International organisations have now become indispensable. In a globalised world, they facilitate cooperation across state frontiers, allowing for the identification, discussion and resolution of difficulties in a wide range of subjects, from peacekeeping and peace enforcement to environmental, economic and human rights concerns. This dimension of the international legal system has permitted the relatively rapid creation of new rules, new patterns of conduct <coughs> and new compliance mechanisms. Indeed, if there is one paramount characteristic of modern international law, it is the development and reach of international institutions, whether universal or global, regional or sub-regional. However, international law is still founded upon the sovereign state. So does the UN have a future? With regard to its primary function, the maintenance of international peace and security, it has not proved a great success. It, it is saddled with its political context and composition. It needs to find a way to build confidence in its endeavours and to work around the inherent and growing political pressures and demands. With regard to its other more specific functions, although politicisation is ever present, it is possible to feel a little bit more optimistic. The three examples chosen in this lecture and others, such as the challenge of climate change, of course, show that the UN has a role in professionalising the context and dealing with targeted issues in a targeted manner. But its conduct has been variable and sometimes tardy. The future of the UN, in short, in my view, lies in maximising its great potential in specific functional areas, both in encouraging states and other actors of the need to take action and in organising and concretising that action. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Malcolm, <clears throat> for this uh, wonderful tour de l'horizon, uh, historically, of not only United Nations, but back of the time of uh, the League of Nations. And somehow, interestingly, uh, what uh, I found uh, quite similar was uh, that the League of Nations was also not successful in peace and security. We know the uh, intervention in uh, Abyssinia by Italy, Nazi Germany, in Austria, in Czechoslovakia, and so on, the Soviet Union in Finland. But on other issues, on economic issues, on health issues, we might say the League of Nations was more successful in, in those uh, rather than in the core uh, uh, reason it was established, the peace and security. But if we can draw a difference here, I'll say that the League of Nations came with a lot of expectations. In the end of the First World War, uh, Woodrow Wilson and others, were very, Poincaré, the French Prime Minister, were very hopeful that the organization will deliver. 
so the league started with high expectation, but ended with low delivery, where the United Nations is somehow the opposite. Somehow the world was more skeptical in 1945. And we can even see that in the UN Charter, the ambition is kind of very much lower than what was the ambition before that. But nevertheless, the United Nations could achieve, as you rightly pointed out, uh, certain uh, non-charter achievement, if we can say, uh, peacekeeping, uh, humanitarian assistance, uh, response to, pub to pandemics, uh, and so on. Thank you so much once again, Malcolm. I now, uh, I would like to ask Anki to uh, moderate the question and answer session because I'm speaking from my mobile and it's not very convenient to see the whole class. So Anki, would you please uh, take the question and answer moderation? Sure. And perhaps since I'm moderating, I'll take the first question as well. Uh, and I'm particularly, uh, uh, delighted that you've spoken about the United Nations and uh, I would like to refer or base my question on Professor Popowski's latest uh, proposal to the to the reform of the Security Council and it's not essentially a reform of the Security Council per se but what Professor Popowski suggests is the creation of three other uh, councils, namely the Peace Building Council, which has specific focus on dealing on issues directly related to uh, peace building situations. And there is a reference to a climate change council, which deals specifically with issues of that nature. And that clubs with the UNFCC, the IEPCC and UNEP. And the third third proposal over here is that there's a spe special health security council. And in your address, uh, Dr. Shaw, you touched upon at least two of these as being core parts where the United Nations needs to focus its energies on. And to circumvent the deadlock which might occur, Professor Bavalsky suggests that you don't need the Security Council's acceptance or even uh, uh, willingness over here because you can create these separate councils through the United Nations Charter in the General Assembly uh, as per enshrined in Article 20. 22. So my question really is that how much of importance will be attached or how much relevance will other nations attach to participating in these councils? And um, but that's part one. I'll wait for the reply and offer part two, which is a country specific uh, agenda. So I, I look forward to your comments, Dr. Shah. Right. <clears throat> well, I think Professor Popovsky's suggestion is a really interesting one, and he's picked up on probably the three major themes of current international law. Um, peace building um, is extraordinarily difficult, and uh, of the three is probably the most political now. Um, the UN can certainly offer this, this suggested commission could certainly act as a forum for the focusing of uh, expertise and advice uh, in a way which can be seen as non-political but functional, uh, if you like, technical. Um, it, it would need, I think, some kind of backup. There would need certainly to be financial resources involved and that I suspect will be a sticking point but it's critical because otherwise <clears throat> we risk seeing an increasing number of failed what's what has become known as failed states states which are in in, in the situation of collapse whether for political reasons say Libya Syria um, until recently uh, or what may very well happen with the climate change that a range of states simply collapse because the climate has changed so dramatically that people cannot live there anymore and need to move on. Or I, I think that's born. Climate change, well, you know, we're seeing extraordinary climatic changes uh, in the world now. And um, I, I think it should be clear to everybody, whatever their stage of industrialization, 
that everybody is in this and uh, it is not a state oriented matter at all. Only international cooperation offers any kind of hope. And again, health security, I don't need to say anything about this. We are deep in the current situation, which will have individual and social implications for decades to come. So I welcome Professor Popovsky's very interesting suggestions and look forward to see how those are, are uh, explained, developed, how they evolve. But well done. Uh, well, perhaps this makes the, the follow up even more juicy here. The, the, at least in the peace building aspect, we now for certain know that the American model will only last for 20 days. So perhaps we can discount so, that. Could you repeat that? The American well, what? With the American model for peace building, I talk in reference to Afghanistan and oh. the situation there. So uh, perhaps that's not the answer. And in this context, what Professor Popolsky offers is Japan as an answer to all the three councils. He suggests that the Japanese have made major advancements in the realm of peace building, although their constitution does not allow it, but they've been heavily involved in, uh, in establishing a sort of a peace building uh, mandate for themselves and for, the, for sending uh, their troops to other nations. Professor Popolsky also talks about the Japanese involvement in healthcare sector. And he also talks about this in the sense of the other council, which is the third council of climate change and how instrumental they've been in that sense. And to that, I can even add, uh, well, I took a sort of a small detour in my studies and studied submarine cables. And the Japanese have a very, very uh, uh, cutting edge approach, although extremely basic, they've placed nodes on their submarine cables in the outer peripheries of their uh, territorial region. To, to that extent, they can sense when the earthquakes are coming or when the tsunamis are coming. But the main point that I'm trying to make here is that, and uh, this is in reference to Professor Pawaski's article, is that if the Japanese are involved in all these councils, perhaps that, that will diminish their, their uh, aspirations of being involved in the Security Council. So, and perhaps you can count India also in this bracket as well, and even the Germans. So does that say? <clears throat> but that, now that is a really interesting suggestion. <clears throat> there are a range of states that are developing and uh, increasingly important powers that need to be integrated properly into the structure of the international community, and particularly the UN. Uh, in addition to the states we've mentioned, I could also mention South Africa, Nigeria. Um, th th there are many, many others. There's got to be a way to allow states like that to feel a part of the international community. Um, I think one of the encouraging, there have been recently encouraging and discouraging Steins, um, the recent wave of fires across a number of countries has has encouraged a wide range of states to send assistance um, to put out these fires. That's been very encouraging. And again, <clears throat> the same with regard to earthquakes, whether the recent one in Haiti or elsewhere. I mean, this is encouraging. And there are a number of states now <coughs> which have developed quick reaction emergency teams to help in uh, these disaster uh, situations. Um, so so the, there, is, there is a way forward. On the other side, what, what I called what we call vaccine nationalism uh, has been very disappointing. Uh, and very understandable, understandable that states prioritize their own citizens. And therefore, if they've got uh, vaccines available, they give them to their own people first. I mean, mo every state does that. But we've got to allow for vaccines to be sent to states which have no access, cannot afford to buy. You, you, one thing we've learned is that you cannot seal off certain countries. There will always be international travel and a virus can be extinguished, say, in Europe. And, and pop up 
in Central Africa. And then, you know, sure as day follows night, it will spread. So the the strategic field becomes not the state, but the whole world. That's a rather long answer, I'm sorry. Oh, please, it is quite riveting, in fact. And, uh, I perhaps do agree with you on those aspects as well. Um, I do invite others also to please share their questions and their thoughts in the lecture. Uh, uh, there's one comment which I'd like to share with you, Professor. We've been in online teaching for quite a while, and uh, my my peer over here says, says, thank you so much, sir. It was a really wonderful lecture, and uh, one hour of learning was perhaps the most enlightening of the year. Uh, so <laughs> we quite agree yeah, with you for your thoughts. Kind. That's very, very kind. Thank you. Uh, I do invite others as well to ask and share their thoughts in the lecture. Uh, uh, I invite Samar to ask his question as well. If he wants to type it out, then uh, we can take a minute, or if he wants to take it live, then we can do so as well. Samar? Uh, yes, I'll be. I'll, I can ask through audio, but I don't think I can open my video right now because I'm in the gym. Uh, but I've been listening to everything that uh, Mr. Shaw has been saying for the last one hour. And I asked this similar question to Professor Abhinav and Professor Pukowski in the last uh, class regarding the situation in Afghanistan right now. And no matter how many articles or how many news channels we watch, I, can, I don't think I can get a better insight about the situation. Uh, than Mr. Shaw's. So I would really like to know your insight. And for us, because we don't know actually how the United Nations function uh, in situations like these, because I, we weren't born or, you know, uh, sailed to have this knowledge regarding the incidents which have happened before we were born. So uh, I would really like to know what the United Nations obligations were in the situation and what the United Nations should do now to uh, better the situation. Thank you, sir. I, I, I'm not sure I caught all of that. This is with regard to Afghanistan. So, yes, uh, yes, sir. OK, so what were the UN's obligations and what are they now? Um, I, I suppose the UN's obligations were to uh, and remain to protect the territorial integrity of Afghanistan. Uh, rules with regard to non-intervention and uh, so forth. There was a civil war going on. There was a recognised international government which received aid from a variety of countries, mainly the United States, of course, but a number of others as well. Um, I, I, in this kind of situation, I'm not sure the UN could have done much. Uh, the I think the irony of the situation is that the situation could have remained relatively stable had the Americans just carried on doing what they were doing. They didn't have many forces there, but they helped the morale of the Afghani National um, Army and they provided air cover and so on and so forth at a relatively low cost to the Americans. No one was calling for massive American intervention. Um, so it's so I personally find it very disappointing that the Americans decided precipitately to pull their forces out, and um, this led to the collapse of the Afghani um, regime. So what are the UN uh, responsibilities now? Well, the fear is of a massive flow <coughs> of refugees, either Tajikistan in the north. Uh, to Iran uh, uh, or in the West or to Pakistan in the East. We, we, we just don't know. Again, the Taliban are giving indications that they are reformed and they respect women's rights. I don't know. We look back at how they were in the 1990s and it's not encouraging. And I think for 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 women in particular, it's devastating, devastating for a woman who's grown up believing that she's got a more or less equal chance to be educated, 
to get a job to be put back into the bottle if that indeed is what is to happen i think would be uh, deeply deeply catastrophic and the dangers to world peace are there potentially we don't know um, let us hope that the taliban focuses all its uh, uh, all its attention upon the <coughs> reconstruction of its country and doesn't uh, try and resurrect the uh, external interventions of the 1990s i i cannot agree more with this uh, absolutely if i can just add one thing in fact united nations has not been successful when states are unwilling to accept international assistance. And in addition to Afghanistan, we can give the example of Libya. Libya is another nightmare, and partly because also the government and, and the various factions in Libya also do not cooperate with the United Nations. Well, we have examples where the cooperation of the government with the United Nations has delivered a lot of results. Let me mention simply Timor-Leste, Croatia, Liberia, Sierra Leone. Many conflicts ended when the new government uh, coming after the civil war has cooperated with the United Nations. But in, on the opposite, it's very difficult when the government does not cooperate with the United Nations. You, UN can only deliver based on the consent and the impartiality of the uh, engagement. Uh, and here probably one uh, recommendation, if I may, is for the United Nations to engage with the Taliban. Now, yep. as, as far as uh, uh, the situation has dramatically changed, the only way to uh, continue any engagement of the United Nations will be to cooperate exactly on the issues which Malcolm Shaw mentioned, women's rights, generally human rights, uh, peace and security, uh, so some sort of uh, uh, peaceful transition uh, and respect for human rights and rule of law, no matter whether the government has done some uh, terrorist attack in the past. The, somehow, if United Nations can negotiate some sort of cooperation with the Taliban, I, I would recommend that way. Thank you. Well, Professor, I'd just like to jump in there and, and suggest that perhaps the, the opposite is already happening in the sense that even if it's in the case of Myanmar or even Afghanistan, using these two as case studies, one can reflect is that for the Taliban or for the military junta in, in Myanmar, they are trying to portray an image of themselves as being benefactors. The underlying principle here could perhaps be that because they do seek recognition and they do seek a, a, a chair at the table in terms of them being a power or, or being designated as a power in control. So they are at least in some sense putting their hand forward and saying that we are ready to discuss Although there has been, we do have a very dark underbelly, but we are ready to 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 come forward and discuss. And now, perhaps to some extent, the ball is in the court of these international organizations to accept the situation as it is and then uh, take it forward from there. Well, I mean, I, I agree with that. Um, it, it's always a difficult situation, isn't it, when you get a regime which has come to power and has acted very, very badly. Um, you know, you want to say, but you're wrong. What you've done is wrong. And I really don't want to get involved with you because what you're doing is totally wrong. On the other hand, if you don't engage, you don't get anywhere. So uh, it, we are torn, aren't we? We're torn. I mean, the worst thing that could happen is that the Taliban goes back to the way it was in the 1990s with increasing threats posed to Western countries and India. Um, and I think that would be uh, very, very unhelpful. So I agree. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what attitude the Taliban is going to adopt. So at this very early stage, Let's um, put our hand out and say, if you want to be part of the international community, 
and accept the, the, the general principles of the international community, then we will do what we can to help uh, economic development, uh, specialist expertise in reconstruction and so on and so forth. I mean, that is the glass full part of the argument. Absolutely. Uh, and Malcolm mentioned the crucial word. When we engage, it should be about development. It should be about uh, the future of uh, 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 the, the reduction of poverty, equality. So this social and economic agenda, definitely even the Taliban will need international assistance on, on, on that. So in a way, I will say the United Nations has many agencies, and I would agree that those agencies, that deal with uh, human rights, for example, should remain critical. They shouldn't reduce the criticism in Myanmar, in uh, uh, Afghanistan, in Iran, and everywhere, in Russia, in China. The human rights community should remain as uh, proactive as it is when human rights violations happen. But in the meantime, there are other agencies within the United Nations, humanitarian agencies, UNDP, and they need to do the engagement. So there is a way to both uh, sanction and engage, but this should be done by different agencies. If the same agency does the same, it is very easy to be uh, uh, compromised. Uh, Professor Malcolm, just taking up a point further from Professor Poposki's, uh, the point which she raised, uh, what do you think about the aspect of integrated missions as per the Brahmini report in this context in Afghanistan where so many uh, it's a failure of of uh, of the system of the of the post conflict system so how how do how does the international community respond as a as a single coherent or in different forms so which which Brahmini uh, Brahmi report had commented upon in specifically in context of Afghanistan well, th that, that's a very in interesting question, particularly in view of what Professor Poposki su su suggested, which is a, a more functionally oriented, <coughs> um, discrete system of uh, engagement. <coughs> You're suggesting a, a, a rather different approach, which is a kind of all embracing approach. Um, I'm not I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I instinctively feel that we should proceed step by step, incrementally, and not go in with um, a thousand advisors in one go. Let's take it step by step and see if it helps. Now, you've raised an issue. Let me take you, which may or may not be part of what you had in your mind, which is the question of the responsibility of the UN if things go wrong by its own officials. This has been a, a developing problem uh, and one which has been the source of legal controversy because there's a, there, there is a gap between the, um, the, the, the responsibility of states, the states of nationality of the officials involved and the UN. So some courts have taken the view that um, that the UK is not responsible for a British citizen who's been behaving badly when he's part of a UN force. It's up to the UN. And the UN says, yeah, OK, but we're immune from all courts anyway. And so the answer is the people who've been abused have no recourse. So there is a, lo a lot of work to be done there, which to me suggests more of a slower graded approach to cooperation than a big bang approach. Thank you. And I think that's particularly true in cases of sexual abuse also by peacekeeping forces in areas where the, they're involved. I, I now invite Mehek to ask a question. Uh, her hand was raised and I would like to acknowledge that. Mehek, floor is yours. Right. Thank you, Professor. I just had a question regarding uh, so when the U.S. had decided to withdraw its troops from Afghanistan, so the U.N. as an international body, couldn't it have foreseen this might Afghanistan being a conflict area essentially since so many years? Couldn't it have, it had uh, foreseen this would happen and stepped in earlier and, you know, sort of pacified the situation on ground? 
can the UN do something like this? That's interesting. I think in practice, no. <clears throat> I think the Americans had taken a strategic decision to get out. It was originally taken by Trump <clears throat> and Biden, for what are probably domestic reasons, decided that enough was enough and he wanted to go and that and that the international implications of what he was about to do were not sufficiently appreciated, but at least by him, because the reports are that the Pentagon was opposed. I know that the UK was very much opposed to this sudden withdrawal, but the UK on its own hasn't got the power to to be on its own. Um, I don't think in this kind of situation the UN could have done anything, even if the Secretary General had picked up the phone to the president and said, look, do you realise what might happen? I don't think uh, the president would have changed his mind. I think he was determined, probably for domestic political reasons, to to say enough is enough, we're not interested anymore. Anyway, it's not our fault, which is, is quite shameful, but nevertheless. Um, it, it, it's very disappointing it, and, and I can see, usually I'm a fairly optimistic kind of fellow and I like to see some silver lining in the clouds, but I can't see any in this one. Uh, Professor, just the clarification that I understand, uh, I think your answer was more from the point of view that could the UN have convinced US say not to withdraw, whereas I wanted to know more about when the UN was aware that USA was going to withdraw, could the UN itself have stepped in in Afghanistan and pacified the situation? Oh, could the UN have sent troops in? Troops, I, peacekeeping forces, or however it could do, I, so, would it be able to do something? I think that would be most unlikely, most unlikely. Um, <clears throat> Firstly, I think for political reasons, an awful lot of states would not want to have intervened uh, in what they might have seen as a lost cause. Uh, secondly, it's not a question really of just sending in a few troops and to man a borderline. Um, if you look at the situation in Afghanistan <clears throat> in the period, the few weeks before the American withdrawal, it was spotty all over. Taliban had control in certain areas. The government had control in a lot more areas, including then all the urban centers. The number of troops that would have been required to to undertake a mission like that would have been quite extensive. They wouldn't have had the experience that the Americans have of working with the Afghan National um, Army. They were obviously closely integrated in the sense <clears throat> that the Afghan army relied on American intelligence, American <clears throat> American uh, training, American air power. Uh, and I don't I don't see anyone else um, willing to do that in a situation of ongoing civil war when the chances of an agreement were, were minimal. It's not like a situation where the two sides have agreed that they want to uh, end the war, but they don't know how to do it. And they're, 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 they're very fearful of each other. That's when the UN can step in and be very successful. But an ongoing civil war spread throughout the country. Um, I, I think it, it would have been a disaster for the UN, in my view. Um. I now invite uh, Professor Parna to ask a question, please. Uh, good evening, sir. Um, my question is pertaining to uh, Kashmir. It's uh, it's a bit uh, off topic, I would say, as everyone were flowing into the debate of Afghanistan. My question uh, is uh, regarding whether the UN uh, handled the Kashmir issue uh, 
or uh, or did they lack in handling the kashmir issue in some way as well as uh, you know only advising about the self determination determination was uh, enough for the kashmiris uh, and my second question is when the uh, uh, when uh, how does the un approach if the countries themselves say it's an internal issue so what does the un do in that case that thank you that was my question Right. <clears throat> now you're getting to difficult questions. Uh, and I'm sorry I can't see you on the screen. You're just, um, a, you're just a voice. Yes. Uh, um, yes, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, it's always nice to see to see the face. <laughs> yeah. Internet problem. <laughs> Look, uh, it, it's, it's very difficult for me as a Brit to intervene in what is a really hot topic <coughs> between India and Pakistan. Um, and you know what, I'd rather not say anything about that at the moment. I'm very happy to have a long discussion about it, but not a very short discussion. My, exp my, my, my experience of short answers is they get misconstrued by one side or the other, and I don't want that to happen. But you ask also what the UN can do in such situations. Now, <clears throat> obviously, you have to decide, is Kashmir an internal matter for India or is it an international matter between India and Pakistan? That's the first question. Um, but does the UN need to decide that? Um, conceptually, yes, because there is an important difference between uh, intervening in an internal matter and intervening in an international dispute. But in reality, in reality, uh, it's less important. Um, it is certainly open to the UN to offer good officers. I, I frankly don't think either side would be willing to accept um, arbitration or an international court uh, proceeding or anything like that. Much as an international lawyer who appears before the international court, much as I would love to be involved in that, nevertheless, I don't think India and Pakistan would wish this to happen. The it is not, I, I, in my view, it is not a situation in which the UN could lay down a law and say, this is the law, you're right, you're wrong. It's a situation of mediation, of constructive engagement, of good officers, of coming to the parties and saying, if you're interested in talking to us, what can we do to help? Is there anything we can do to suggest lowering the temperature of, of making the tension a little less high, of helping you a bit by bit? But it depends, well, primarily, of course, on India. Uh, I, I know Kashmir is divided but most of it is, is, is in India. But if the Indian government says no, with nothing to do with you, there's nothing really much that the UN can do. And I suppose similarly with regard to the part of Kashmir that it is, that is run by Pakistan. I know um, it's not a satisfactory answer you wanted, but so i was just i was just uh, professor i was just wondering whether uh, thus uh, as you had uh, spoken about self determination in your lecture earlier so i was just thinking whether that in that time like in history when un had advised uh, that uh, the Kash let the kashmiris decide you know, in such a uh, conflict zone, let the Kashmiri take the call whether they want to be uh, joining uh, India or Pakistan or having an independent uh, state. Uh, was it possible, like, uh, uh, was it possible for them to, you know, determine such a big uh, or take a such a big, uh, you know, vote for such a big, uh, you know, change in their life? Was it possible for the citizens of Kashmir, uh, basically that time, if I would say, was it possible for the local Kashmiris to take the decision? Was it possible? Did the uh, UN actually un uh, give the right, cor correct advice or did they falter somewhere? And that I would want to know that. And the truth is, I don't know about, you're talking about the situation in 1947, 47, 48. Yeah. I don't know enough about it to answer that, and, and I don't want to give you an answer off the top of my head, which 
I may reflect upon and read about and find is not right. So thank you. I mean, I know only the general outlines that there was a <clears throat> there was a Hindu ruler with the majority of Muslim population. Hindu ruler opted to join the Indian Union. Um, disturbances arose. Pakistan intervened. India countered, and so on. So the basic stuff, I've got a vague idea. I don't know enough about the UN involvement to answer your question. And I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay, you're Professor. Thank you. Be, you answered you're quite a lot. To, you're going to have to invite me to your university so we can sit down and talk about it. Sure. Sure, uh, Professor. Thank well, you. Thank I, will, I, will, I, will, I will have a petition prepared for, for this invitation and then circulate it <laughs> amongst the university and perhaps <laughs> South Asia as well. Uh, I now invite uh, uh, I now invite Trisha to ask a question, and if time permits, another one as well. Trisha, the floor is yours. Um, hello, sir. Uh, it's a great privilege to be speaking with you. Uh, we in fact had public international law last semester, and uh, your textbook was our bible. It is what got us through. Considering we've had online education for over a year and a half, so I'm grateful to be asking you a question. Um, to begin with, uh, I'm going to go back to the Afghanistan issue. So China seems to be open to recognizing the Taliban rule. Uh, in That's what's been circulating in the news. So being one of the five permanent members of the Security Council, firstly, what would you what would um, what are the legal implications of uh, this stance of China when it comes to uh, taking up peace building procedures uh, in Afghanistan if things go awry and also what would what would be um, what would the legal implications of the Taliban being recognized as a state entity by the UN be given China's stance because I know you have written quite a bit on the Monte video convention um, can I just clarify, what do you mean by China's stance? So um, there have been a couple new news articles about China uh, being open to recognizing the Taliban's rule in Afghanistan. OK. All right. <clears throat> um, firstly, it, it is not the practice these days in most countries to recognize new governments as distinct from new states. Um, so, for example, the UK does not have to make a decision to whether it recognised Taliban or not. Afghanistan is a recognised state, <coughs> has been for a very long time, so there's no issue. Um, and thus the UN does not need to recognise uh, the Taliban, of, uh, with the exception that when, when the officials of the Taliban come to New York and ask for their credentials to be recognized as the representative of, Af of Afghanistan, then the UN can discuss it. However, I, I think uh, there's no chance that they will not be recognized. They've got total control of the country by all accounts. Uh, and I think we all have to accept that and uh, and move on, but move on very carefully. Um, you know, I, I think it is, I think it's probably contrary to what Professor Pohovsky said before. I'm not sure it is for the UN to make the first move or any other state. I think it's up to the Taliban to show that they welcome uh, foreign engagement, including, but going beyond, uh, the UN. I think if they were willing to uh, show a, a modicum of willingness to uh, engage, then I think other states would simply recognise the situation, engage with them, and in due course there would be diplomatic missions. I know there already are from, from Russia certainly, and I think also China. Um, so, uh, but but these are delicate moments, and it's really, and I think the Tal Taliban is beginning to recognise this because of their press conference yesterday and today, 
<coughs> seems to show a willingness to put a good face on. Um, hopefully this is not just a little bit of uh, propaganda and hopefully there is something there. Obviously they have a, a particular approach to their country and to their people and we have to respect that but we also have to respect the rights of 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 everyone in Afghanistan. I mean, as I see Afghanistan, I see two very contrasting images. I see a, a cargo plane of the Americans flying out with completely jam-packed with Afghanis. But I, I mean, I can't wrap my head around the fact of what the Talibanis have said in their official statements. It somehow just doesn't link. It doesn't fit the profile of a junta. And this, to my mind, seems like them putting on a strong face of respecting the rights of others for not only themselves but for international acceptance and i think there is some sort of merit to that but only as you said time will tell what are the underlying reasons for this and whether is or not is this a smoke screen um, i saw there was a hand raised by samarth if you would like to ask his question uh, i would request him to come forward if not then uh, we can close. Samarth, would you like to ask? I don't hear him, so uh, let me thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Shaw, for your very enriching and enlightening discussion. Before we sign off on a lighter note, I would like to share that I see your Leicester, Leicester. I hope this is the university badge and not the Leicester City football uh, team's uh, uh, badge because I am a strong supporter of one club in Manchester, which is United and not a city. So this is a note we can have a different, different uh, lecture on. And uh, well, let me just clarify. <coughs> um, I'm I'm originally from Liverpool. That's where I was born and that's where I grew up. <clears throat> so my primary allegiance goes to Liverpool Football Club. But because I've lived in Leicester for quite a while, I also support Leicester City Football Club. I do not support any club in Manchester. <laughs> well, I do. And uh, it's it's been a hard, it's been a very tough relationship over the past 10 years. But I think those are the times when you have to stand by and support and I hope for a brighter future. I see Samad's hand is raised again. Samad, would you like to ask a question and then we can perhaps close? Uh, yeah, I just had to, uh, you know, give an insight about the situation in Kashmir and the situation in Afghanistan. So what I have learned, uh, this is my final year of law and my second time that I've opted for this elective. And I think that by now, we have, I have understood that even if the situations seem similar, it doesn't mean that they are similar. So according to me, the situation is in Kashmir was of eradicating terrorism from a state that was a red hot um, target of terrorism. And Afghanistan situation is a situation where terrorism has occupied a democratically run government that was under American supervision. So the measures taken by the government to ensure the eradication of terrorism from the state of Kashmir cannot be compared to the situation of Afghanistan, which we are seeing right now, because it cheapens the situation what the Afghanis are facing right now. They are um, deprived of what they have been provided for the last 20 years. And in Kashmir, the government had determined, were determined to give the people of Kashmir what they were never given since the independence. So that is my take on the situation and I hope I'm right because I'm not sure if I'm right. Well, <clears throat> I'm afraid I missed most of that because the quality of the line was so poor. <clears throat> I caught about there was no no relationship between Afghanistan and Kashmir. Well, I, I'm not making any connection between them. Beyond that, I'm, I'm afraid I didn't catch. Uh, actually, sir, this was uh, this is a common topic uh, in the country right now because I think majority of the people who are active on, so on social media consider them themselves to be leftists without any exact knowledge about the situations and getting deep into research. So uh, I'll repeat myself briefly again. 
um it's just an insight and an opinion on the two situations and uh, as you said that you don't have enough research and knowledge about the situation of kashmir uh so i have researched quite a lot about that topic and the considering what information i have received from professor abhinav uh, professor popovsky and your insights today uh, i've come to a conclusion that both the situations are completely different even though they look similar from a particular point of view but according to what i have studied in this subject and the whole of course uh, ba llb what what i'm pursuing i don't think these situations are correct to be compared with each other and uh, the 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 um, imminent need of united nation intervention in afghanistan is not similar and not needed in kashmir right now that's my take on this topic which professor aparna asked i think Yeah. Um, sorry, Samant, I did not, uh, and I don't know what you actually thought, but I was not comparing both issues at all. My question was totally different. It's okay. Well, uh, let me perhaps end by saying that South Asia is the hotspot for uh, terrorist activities, and these uh, freedom movements. I recollect what uh, former president of the America said that Kashmir is. this epicenter of all disputes and you can refer to the koreas as well and uh, other junctions where in where in land is disputed very heavily and uh, with those words i would like to thank uh, dr shaw for uh, sharing his expert thoughts with us and be grateful to him for for accepting our invitation and uh, professor dr last words and then we can close Well, I'm very grateful that you invited me. <clears throat> I have much enjoyed this, even though I'm sitting in Leicester and it looks as if it's going to rain again, and you're sitting uh, far away from me. Um, nevertheless, through the wonders of technology, we have been able to connect, and I've enjoyed the experience very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much, sir. Technology has truly been the great equalizer of our time. <laughs> and with those words i thank everyone else also over here professors popowski and merotra and we look forward to welcoming everyone else also for our future lectures professor thank you so much and goodbye thank you thank you and goodbye thank you professor thank you